All right, so it says consider the uh, circuit shown below, look at each circuit carefully. Yeah, and, uh, we went over how they are not identical because of battery V2 has its direction reversed in circuit B. But I'm going to basically do a single analysis. And for circuit B, I'm going to make a tiny modification that allows me to um, get the new answers very quickly. So, um, so yeah, so what I'm hoping you are beginning to realize with this general problem solving approach is that it's the general approach for almost any physics question, which is that in my first step, first half of problem solving, all I'm trying to do is write down enough equations, enough equations that relate enough of my unknowns to the knowns so that, uh, so that I can do the algebra and solve it. And what changes with the different uh, physical circumstances is what tool I have at my disposal to write down those equations. In circuit context, the tool happens to be Kirchhoff's rules. Uh, with the force problems, it was Newton's second law. So, um, so that's a, it's that general approach I'm using. So um, with the circuit, I'm gonna be using Kirchhoff's rules. So let me write down those two rules. Uh, I have the junction rule, which I'm gonna be using first. Junction rule says, the sum of all the currents coming in is equal to sum of all the currents going out. And the loop rule says, sum of all the voltage changes that you collect as you go around the loop, some loop, is equal to zero. So I'm gonna be applying these rules a few times. <laughs> so in solving this circuit, the main thing I'm interested in is the current. Once I know the current, then a lot of other information, it's uh, pretty easy for me to figure out. So let me label all the currents. So I like to label all the branches. I see this branch here. Let me label current through this branch. And um, I see this branch here. Let me label current through this branch. And let me, I see this branch here. Let me label current through this branch. And oh, um, and I like to give current subscripts that match the registers whenever possible. I mean, they don't have to, but doing that um, reduces the potential of confusion on my part as I write down the equations. Um, I, so yeah, so that's what I'm doing. Um, okay, I think I labeled all the current. So I have three unknowns, which means I need three equations. So now I'm on the hunt for those three equations. The, I use the junction rule first because the junction rules are pretty simple to apply. In this circuit, I have two junctions and the simple rule I follow in applying junction rule is that I always leave one junction unused. The reason for that is I'm looking for an independent system of equations. And this is the very last junction it's a guarantee to give me something that's dependent on the previous equations. So I'm going to make sure I leave one junction unused. So that gives me a definite number of junctions I can use. That's why I use the junction rule first, because always I know exactly how many times I need to use it. So looking at that one junction, it looks like I have two coming in. I'm just kind of following that through, that's I2. And I have I3 going out. Okay, so that's the way I labeled it. You might have labeled it differently. Fine, but that's the way I labeled it. So I'm gonna have, the, as the junction rule equation, it's gonna be, um, so my equation one is gonna be I2 current in is equal to current out, I1 plus I3. So I need two more equations and those are going to come from the loop rule. So I need to find the two loops. <laughs> And uh, you have quite a bit of freedom in how to pick your loop. I think I'm gonna pick it this way. So I do have some rule of thumb to follow. I, my goal is to minimize overlap. And one of the easiest way to minimize overlap is to choose the smallest possible loop. Then I think unless you're doing something super silly like choosing the same loop twice, uh, it's uh, easier to avoid um, having, coming up with a somehow accidentally a dependent equation. So the loops I'm going to use, I'm going to use this loop. That's gonna be my 
Um, let me label that as two for equation number two. And uh, the direction of the loop will be this way. And uh, I'm going to uh, use this rectangular thing here. Um, which direction should I go? Um, yeah, let me try to follow the direction of the battery. I mean, I don't have to, but I'm going to. Um, so do I want to do that? You, you know, let me actually do it the other way so that I can illustrate the sign convention a little bit better. So I'm actually gonna um, go around this way against, so I'm gonna try to follow the direction of current I3. So against the battery and then this way. So this loop, uh, let me label it loop number three is gonna go this way. Okay, so let me write down the equation too. Starting from here, I go across if we want from negative to positive terminal. So I'm going to collect a voltage change of plus V1. And here, as I go through R1, I'm going in the same direction as the direction of the current I1. So I'm gonna have voltage drop of minus R1 I1. And then completing the loop as I go across R2, I'm going in the same direction as I2. So it'll be minus R2 I2. Uh, collecting all those changes, they should add up to zero. That's what the loop rule says. Uh, you, for number three, let me start from this point here and I imagine moving up. So as I go across to register R1, I'm going against the label the current. So I'm gonna be collecting the register, uh, voltage change R1, I1. And as I go across the battery this time, I am going across the battery from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So there's actually a voltage drop of minus V2, yeah, voltage drop. And then as I go across the register R3, there's another voltage drop. I'm going in the same direction as I3. So that's gonna be R3, I3 is equal to zero. So I have a system of three equations, three unknowns, should be simple enough to solve it. I'm just gonna save a little bit of time by using a computer algebra system. <laughs> so this is the computer algebra system that I've been using. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I think I've been now been using Sage enough to <laughs> know the syntax uh, by heart. So I'm gonna declare the variables first. Um, that's my all my current, my unknowns and um, my batteries, V1 and V2, and my resistances, R1 and, um, it, these will have to be in any particular order. I'm just telling Sage what the uh, algebraic variables are. And I think if I'm reading the documentation right, I don't actually have to set this equal to anything because once I do this declaration, then Sage knows what this is. You know, It knows I1 is something. And, and like I4, it complains because it's not defined. Okay, so I'm going to be using the solve function. I've used it before. And I, when I get the result, I'm gonna put it into a variable solve. So that's what that is. Um, and the three equations that I have, I2 is equal to I1 plus I3, uh, V1 minus R1 times I1 minus R2 times I2 is equal to zero. R1 times I1 minus V2 minus R3 times I3 is equal to zero. Those are my three equations. And I'm asking Sage to solve for I1, I2, and I3. Uh, yeah, that should have Give me the answer in a few seconds. By the way, I don't know why even, it even takes a few seconds. The Sage must be, I don't know, compiling something. Because um, most uh, computer algebra systems would do this in like a fraction of a second. So I don't know why it took so long. Uh, so uh, this is I, this is I1, this is I2, and this is I3. So that's it, I'm done. <laughs> now the question that we are working on, uh, it asks for um, these in numerical values. So I need to um, plug in, if I want to check if my answers are right, I need to actually plug in the numbers. So let me, let me do that. Um, so what I need to do is I need to define a dictionary of the values. So um, my V1 is 1.6. Uh, my V2 is, 
um, sorry, blanking out 1.4. <laughs> My uh, R1 is um, the question asks in milliampers. Let me leave this exercise for you. If I specify the resistances in kilo ohms, then the answer I get for current will be in milliampere. So let me just put in the resistances in kilo ohms, <laughs> R2. And you can figure out for yourself that that's how the units work out. So, okay, so that's my rule uh, for plugging in all the values. Now I can simply do this, uh, subs rule two. Give me the answer. I1 is 0 0.6 milliampere. I2 is 0 0.4 milliampere. And I3 is minus 0 0.2 milliampere. So, oh, can I have this always on top? No, oh, okay. So 0 0.6, 0 0.4, hmm, um, R3. Now I could put in the negative sign, but that negative sign, it's meaningful only to me in the sense that this negative sign simply tells me that the current through I3 actually flows the other way instead of the direction I labeled. And I doubt the question assigns any universal meaning to that. Because this, so I'm just gonna say 0 0.2, because uh, I think it makes sense to me that the question would want to know the magnitude and figure that I'm gonna know the <laughs> direction for me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, they don't want me putting in actual signs here, because um, yeah, if the question somehow asks for direction separately, then I'll do that. So, okay, good. Now for part B, I'm, this is what I wanted to tell you, that I don't have to do any new work. All I really have to do to the part B is figure out where V2 is and simply replace it with a minus V2. Like once I do that, then, um, then, so you know, that'll turn this equation three into R1, I1 plus V2 minus R3, I3 is equal to zero. And technically you can resolve the equation using the new value, but I see that nothing really changes other than this sign changing. So what I think I can do instead of doing all that tedious, I mean, you know, I didn't really do it, but instead of doing all that tedious work all over again, I can simply take the result to here and replace it so that, um, ooh, um, let me do it this way. Replace the symbol V2 with a new symbol minus V2. I, I can do that and you know compare that with the previous result. And I think that's gonna get me the values I want. So really all I have to do is this. So this gets me the equation with that substitution of V2 with the minus V2. And then I can take that and do another substitution for the plugging in the numbers because in terms of the magnitudes of these numbers, they are still the same. Uh, and I realized you know, I could have done it in one step by changing my rule so that this 1.4 is minus 1.4. But let me try it this way. So that's gonna give me new I1. Note how it's uh, you know more complex than simply this turning into negative because it's got that whole expression on the line. So it's now uh, 0.04 milliampere. Let me do that for the rest of the currents. So I2, oh, now bigger. Oh, all right, I guess it's bigger. And you know, I guess if I spend some time, I can see how with this circuit, you would have more current through these uh, kind of main outside branch of the circuit and maybe less current through here. Like, makes sense to me. <laughs> but you know, that's the kind of thing that, I hope you would spend some time making sure that the change of the current like qualitatively from here to what you see here, that that's something that makes intuitive sense from what you can see here, just geometrically. And I guess the reason that intuition is helpful is, 
I think as you look at this change, I my intuition tells me that more power is dissipated in circuit B and less power in A. Mainly, this is what I'm thinking in that um, in so um, in A, these two batteries were opposing each other. So that meant not as much current was flowing through the circuit as could have. So that I think would have reduced the, how much power the circuit was able to dissipate. And here, the batteries are working in the same direction. So more current flows. And I think that would uh, increase the amount of current, amount of power that can be dissipated. So that's what my intuition tells me. Now, let me do the actual calculation. And oh, how do I want to do this actual calculation? Um, Hmm. I think I can have this expression for power. Um, I so so this is the expression for power. I one times or I one squared times um, R one, and I think I can do this. I can substitute. Um, with the rule from the solution, one of the solutions, because this will replace I. Well, let me just try this to make sure, yeah, it works the way I intended. And then I can do another substitution with my rule. Um, so when I do no and nothing additional, um, that'll be for circuit A. For circuit B, I'll have to do this substitution again. So, yeah. So, oh, oh, but this is the, um, oh, let me try this. So when I do I1, I2 squared times R2 plus, so this is the, this would be the total power dissipated in the circuit. I'm adding up power dissipated in each individual registers. And I wonder what does, um, so th this is where I'm putting in a, a list as an argument for subs function. Don't know if it will work. Let me see if it works. Great, it works. <laughs> okay, so I can do this. Um, now substitute again with the uh, rule for plugging the numbers. Okay, so that's how much power was dissipated in the circuit A. Let me double check that that's correct. And the power that was dissipated in circuit B. So all I have to do is take the same expression and what I'm substituting, I have to make sure that I do this substitution of uh, V2 changing it to minus V2. And you know, I'm putting a lot of work on the computer algebra system because I'm basically having it do this. I'm having it um, take the solution, uh, replace V2 with minus V2, that has a new solution, use that to substitute in I1, I2, I3 here to get an expression uh, for power in terms of entirely known quantities and substitute in the known values to get the final power. So uh, it's a lot of work that uh, computer algebra system is doing. What? This object has, oh, okay. Um, Darn the syntax. <laughs> so I'm sure there's a smarter way to do this. I'm just gonna do it this way so that I can just get an answer quickly. Um, or yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna do it this way. And, uh, while telling you that there is a quicker way to do it. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, you know, th there's a, sh should there be a way to to an iterative thing, it's fine. Um, yeah, I just remembered how I would do it. And, um, oh, you know, let me finish this and then I will flaunt my knowledge of Python syntax, I think. All right, so that's the answer. <laughs> oh, wait. My answer disappeared. So that's the answer, 4.5404 uh, 
so yeah, I was right. Uh, the more power is dissipated in circuit B than circuit A. And uh, let me show you the power of this being a Python thing. Um, because what I wrote here, it's a very uh, tedious manual thing. And um, Python has a really nice um, um, uh, loops uh, syntax. I can do this. Solution of zero, i uh, dot sub, subs uh, v2 minus v2 for i in um, list zero, one, two, three. I mean, I can also do range, but it just makes this place by explicitly. So I'm pretty sure this will work. So yeah. So th this is the the useful thing about Sage Math being built on Python syntax because Python is a powerful interpreted language. So uh, when you <laughs> come up with a problem like this, there's a, a you know proper programming way to solve that problem. Um, so. Okay, so that uh, um, this circuit and this is uh, what I call um, simplest non-trivial circuit problem. It's non-trivial in that um, you have to use Kirchhoff's rules. There's no other way to do it. And it, of that kind, it's the simplest circuit because you only need the three system of three equations. Um, and any other, so, um, you know, if you could do it with a system of two equations, there was probably a way to do it without involving um, Kirchhoff's rules. 